Okay, so everyone, welcome to the 2013 Wisconsin Rewind Lecture. We are very excited to welcome back a UW alum who is the head programming um, strategist at YouTube, which is awesome. Um, his name is Ben Rells, and he's a really cool guy. He hasn't been back to campus in almost 13 years, so I want all of you guys to give him a warm welcome. And without further ado, welcome Ben Rells. 100, 200 of you guys came. I appreciate it. The 38,000 that didn't come, they're missing out. <laughs> uh, and I'm not sure if we're still, maybe you're just fiddling. All right, listen, so I appreciate you coming, but I do want to give you the quick background. Let's say, you know, my last 40 or so years in three minutes. Then we're going to do about 30 minutes on what I remember from Wisconsin, the lessons that stuck with me, and then about 30 minutes about YouTube and how you can all have channels and become YouTube stars and all that. All right, there we go. All right, um, I, I literally would not be here if it weren't for the University of Wisconsin. Both my parents went here. That's them in front of Celery Hall, I believe, in 67. <laughs> yep. That's, uh, let's see, class of 68, my mom, Mary, Ben Rellis. I, I work at YouTube. Babies is, it's just the bread and butter. So I, I know that, you know, we got to get a couple babies in here. I grew up in Madison. Here until I was about five, went to uh, Philadelphia. Who laughed? Who laughed? <laughs> That's a beautiful smile. <laughs> I don't want anybody laughing about it. Uh, lived in Philadelphia from five to 18. That's me in high school. I was uh, 6'5 and about 80 pounds. It was a good look. <laughs> me and my buddies in high school. Uh, this is freshman year at college. My first, so the first thing I did after I graduated from Wisconsin is I started a company. I was a senior here, and I was into all this different entrepreneurial stuff, which I'll get in, into later, and I decided to start a company right out of school. It was a direct marketing company, started with two friends, took kind of a big risk, and from 1997 to 2002, ran this marketing company. The first two years were awesome. Third year was okay. Fourth and fifth year were really tough, so I ended up going to business school. I worked at ad agencies for three years. That's TBWA in Los Angeles. And then I had kind of my big professional break in 2007, after three years of working at ad agencies and being kind of fascinated by what was happening with social media and Facebook and at the time MySpace and YouTube. I just wanted in on it. So this was a video I created called I Got a Crush on Obama. Put a little team together around it, create a website called Barely Political. Barely Political has now done about 1.9 billion views on YouTube. The Obama Girl series is like 100 million of the views. We have a big series called The Key of Awesome, which is actually a billion of the total views. And we just, on this channel, kind of crank out comedy videos, two or three videos a week. Then uh, Barely Political uh, became kind of a full comedy team and part of a company called Next New Networks, which acquired Barely Political. It's completely different than what was the case 10 years ago, when if you had a big idea, you didn't get to just make it, put it up, and hope tons of people saw it. You had to work through a lot of traditional systems in place that, fortunately, for a lot of creators, aren't there anymore. Uh, that's me and Cy. He had the most uh, views in 2012 and 2013. Uh, and that's me and Aaron Paul. This, this really doesn't have to do with my story. It's just so cool. I won tickets to the Breaking Bad finale, and I'm going through my pictures. That's how I just work it in here. So that was uh, two weeks ago. <laughs> All right, now it's time to rewind. It is YouTube, uh, uh, that is the YouTube logo flipped around. This is the homecoming rewind speaker. We're going to rewind all the way back to 1993. And I'll try to give you, I, I, I thought about this a lot, went through a lot of different things which I felt like were the most important lessons to talk about from my time at Wisconsin. I picked three, so I'm going to tell you a few stories about my four years here and how they ended up really impacting the way that I approached my career and, and the way that I approached especially things um, you know, with online video. OK, here we go. So 1993, uh, we went to the Rose Bowl my freshman year. That's the quarterback at the time, who's now the head coach or the quarterback's coach of your quarterback from last year. So you know, it all comes full circle. Uh, that is, I'm just set the stage, 1993, October, this time 20 years ago, Conan O'Brien debuted his new show. That's Louis C.K., Robert Smigel, Bob Odenkirk, crazy staff, uh, Timberlake, Kristen Christina Aguilera, Brittany, Gosling. They were all announced in October 1993 as part of the new Mickey Mouse Club. 
Uh, this is all just to, to kind of, it's, uh, I guess 20 years is a long time ago. Obama was 30, he didn't even know, he, he couldn't have any idea that I was gonna make a video about him. He was just, how would he possibly? <laughs> Who would have ever guessed? Okay, uh, so that's me and the guy making the mixtape. So, 1993, uh, I get to school. I'm probably your kind of typical 18-year-old balance of like confident and also super scared and I think I'm awesome, but I'm also completely nervous in this new place with 40,000 people. But I do decide that in my first couple of weeks here, I want a job where I can be entrepreneurial because that's what I want to do. I want to be entrepreneurial. And so, this is not actually what I sold, but I saw an ad in the Badger Herald that you could sell something called the bar card. It must be out of business because I couldn't find it online. This is like the Key West version of it. But essentially what the bar card is, is it, it costs uh, five bucks and you can get buy one, get one free drinks at bars around Wisconsin. Have any of you got this? Does this still exist or no? No, okay. It did in 1993. So anyways, I see this ad and I decide this is awesome. I want to go sell these things because who would not want 10 buy one, get one free drinks, that's 50 bucks. This is gonna be the easiest sale ever. And so I just felt like it was one of those times where you wanna take a risk. And I think that's a good thing to do. So I, I went to the guy on State Street. It cost $300 for 100 cards that you could sell for five bucks. It cost 500 for 200 cards, and it cost $1,000 for 500 cards. But you get the best value per card at the bottom one, and if I sell those cards, 500 cards for you know, five bucks a piece, I make $1,500, and 500 cards, there's like 40,000 students here. So I go all in on the $1,000, I didn't give them a $1,000 bill, I just Googled it. That would've been cool, but I didn't. I uh, just went in and I, got, I wrote a check. A lot of the money I earned in high school, just a lot, I, just, I was all in, because it was time to take a risk, and I sold uh, $40 of bar cards. Um, <laughs> total, not like right when I got out the door, just total before I gave up. And it was, um, I just, I went out to like first a, a corner and I thought it'd be easy, like, hey guys, you want like uh, drinks, right? And got blown off. It was, it was like, uh, just, uh, we can reenact it. Hey, you guys want bar cards? Like that, exactly like that. <laughs> that same nervous no, what? No, so it was really bad. Uh, and, I, and I took this, and this is me back in my dorm, and look, I, had a, I actually really, I love my freshman year. This was a low point, this $1,000 investment. Um, I, 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 you know, events, found some great classes, I wrote for the Badger Herald. It wasn't like I sat in my dorm room mourning the thousand bucks, but the bar card sat in my bedroom, like staring me down, dude, you did horrible with this. And the guys wouldn't buy them back, and I couldn't give them away to my friends. Okay, I tell this story, I guess, in part because I still believe in taking big risks and investing in yourself. And ultimately, that's kind of what got me over this, was being convinced by people that I trusted that this is, this is part of what, now you don't want to go, I'm not advising you guys to go spend $1,000 on whatever thing you can sell. But that there really, there's no better investment that you guys can make in yourselves. And you don't need to go this big, but that it's just part of taking risks, is that some things are gonna work and some aren't, and that as you go through college, it's an amazing time to take some chances and to figure out what you like by also figuring out what you don't like and figuring out what you're not so good at. For me, it was one-on-one you know, -on -one direct sales. I wasn't so good at it as a freshman, but it was a, a big step for me. So you know, I, I, that year, I don't think I did anything entrepreneurial, but the fall of 2000, no, 1994, uh, I go and I was selling soft pretzels in Philadelphia as my summer job, so I decided now I'm gonna take another chance. I'm gonna take another big risk. I'm gonna go and I'm gonna buy these super pretzels for like 22 cents at Sam's Club, and then I'm gonna go to the football games, and I'm gonna set up a big cart and get a permit and sell super pretzels when people go into Camp Randall in the morning, and that was gonna be uh, my business. So I go and we did it. This is, this is the only picture I had of it. This is like um, me, my, that's my, my cousin Noah, who I don't know, maybe he's, 11 there, but he went to Wisconsin too, and now I think he's like at Stanford or something, but um, I, I got him out to be my helper on this pretzel thing of mine. This is, this is sophomore year now. And so I go and I set up the, the booth, this cart. I had gone to Sam's Club the night before at like, you know, 7 p.m. and bought these huge bags of pretzels. I did go in for another thousand bucks, and uh, 
or no, maybe it was like 500 worth of pretzels and soda. We didn't drink water really then. People thought that was silly. But, you know, we essentially, like, loaded up this car with pretzels and uh, sodas to sell to people on the way in. And I woke up at like 5 a.m., got there at like, I don't know, 8 a.m., and by like 8.30 in the morning for an 11 o'clock game, people come up and they say, like, what do you got here? And I said, pretzels. And they, how much? Uh, they're two bucks, because that's what I was going to do. Two bucks, three for five. And they look at me like, two bucks for a pretzel? All right, give me six of them. <laughs> and it was awesome. It was so great. I sold out everything in like, I don't know, maybe an hour and a half. I ended up selling pretzels everywhere. I went to the Rose Bowl and like sold them in the stands. I did all the home games. That, me and my cousin, that was probably the fourth time. The first time I didn't like get a whole, you know, grill situation going. But I did like 10 of these games and it was great. And I think that, you know, for me, looking back on it, um, it was really about kind of, and this was one of several times in college. I also started a cake delivery business in college. I did my junior and senior year. It's a, it was an interesting time where, you know, when you're in a full-time job, you're reviewed every quarter, and what were the results, and everything is measured in a way where you can't necessarily do that in college. Now, first of all, risk is different for everybody. Like, there's probably one of you guys were in Afghanistan last year thinking, like, dude, selling pretzels is not risk. Or some of you guys, when you think about risk, it has nothing to do with money. It's the first time you're going to be a president of a club or join the crew team or figure out some way to um, just get out of your comfort zone, basically. And for me, from firsthand experience, I feel like when I look back on 20 years, the you know, seven or eight things that stand out as these um, you know, career-changing, game-changing moments, they all had that moment of huge pit in my stomach. Invest in yourself, trust yourself. And then the Obama girl thing was after the, the one video I did got three million views, then I was like, okay, well now I love this. YouTube is the place you know, where I really feel like I could do something much bigger than a one-off video, so I created this character about this Obama girl character that basically is infatuated with how smart and what a great leader, and it was kind of a parody on both sides. It was a little bit like making fun of the fact that people loved Obama but didn't really know why, but it was also a little bit, um, you know, tapping into just this uh, genuine obsession people had with Obama, and from, uh, you know, a little bit of the, the YouTube strategy part of it, from my perspective, it felt like this was a great way to kind of join a conversation at a time of the year where not many people were talking about Obama. Uh, not even people actually knew who Obama was. The news had nothing to talk about. So I felt like if I do this video and it's about Barack Obama and it's a girl who's obsessed with him, that's enough of a headline where the news is going to love it. And that's going to be like the ideal people to spread this because the wonks and the pundits who are just looking for things to talk about are going to put this on their news channels. And I really felt like uh, this video was worth putting together a whole team. Those are the directors, Larry and Kevin, that I found on Craigslist. So I think I have, let's, uh, that's me on Fox News. I think, let me see, I don't, I'm going to try to play this from over here. I, I have like a 45 second video of some of the reaction to this video, because only about a third of you guys saw it. So let's see here. Amber Lee Edinger's become like a rock star, you know, of course, as the Obama girl. You're like Jon Stewart, much better looking. Thanks. That's what you are. <laughs> you want to be the voice of a generation? Get in line. You guys hear that? It goes, me. Obama girl. Senator Clinton, if you ever interrupt Obama girl again, <laughs> I will personally escort you from this building. Do I make myself clear? She's just the front. Yeah, I said, can you be the person that represents my man crush on Barack Obama? <laughs> exactly. Right. An advertising consultant named Ben Rellis wrote that song. All right, you get the idea. So, um, it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was really great because the video itself, what I didn't really anticipate happening that did happen is it became a real representation about how YouTube was letting people participate in this election in a way they never had before. So it was a story that lasted much longer than that video. And we ended up, she had a blog and she had t-shirts she sold and she went to the conventions and you saw there she's on like Saturday Night Live and all these different places. And so it, it actually led to me being able to leave, I, I put the website up in June, middle of June 2007, I sold the website in early August to another company that I went to. Um, basically left my job and was able to run a creative network and it was really based on being able to do something that I, you know, kind of in the same way I feel like in the pretzels I learned from the bar cards and did better in the pretzels. 
I really feel like the first two videos got me to a place, taking a couple chances and risks, where on the third one, I knew what I was doing, I was locked and loaded, and I was really confident it was gonna work, and that led to this overall um, network, which I was able to start. So, the, the kind of takeaways for me here, because, and I could fill up hours with all my, you know, things I thought would work and didn't work, and I have a handful that did, the uh, why avoid risk, you know, I think a lot of it ultimately is that there's, there's the fear of failure and what are people going to think and it's, I got to imagine even more so now with, you know, Facebook and Twitter and Google Plus and everything you do being tracked and all that. So, you know, and I, and I get that and I am definitely um, someone who, you know, when I think of these things, I think about, you know, what's, what's going to be sort of like the, the end result here. What am I going for? Uh, I think that people avoid risk ultimately because there's a certain amount of fear of failure and what are people going to think? And one thing I, I wanted to, um, to try to work into this was something someone told me once, which I, I just think is pretty spot on. It, it's basically, you know, when you're 20, you, it's just kind of inevitable. You really uh, are worried about what other people think. It becomes a lot of your headspace, what do people think about me? And then when you're 30, you start to realize that it doesn't really matter what people think about you. You need to figure out what works for you and what makes you happy. And then when you're 40, you realize nobody's really thinking about you. They're thinking about themselves. They're not even worried about you. So, you know. <laughs> I, I'm almost 40. I have to admit, I still think about what other people think all the time. But with each of these things, I think, for me, there's been a certain amount of just, this is going to be my philosophy on some of these big risks. One, just investments in yourself are good. They're not all going to work. It's just like any kind of investment portfolio. Some of them just aren't going to work. But if it's something you're passionate about and you love, it doesn't have to be a big financial commitment. I just think when you invest time, money, effort into your own projects, that's the best possible investment you can make. Okay, the next thing I would say is my overall big takeaways from Wisconsin, most important things I would, I would tell somebody uh, is that you are in a really good position to be asking for advice and guidance right now and help in a way that I did a little bit of at Wisconsin and wish I did much more of. But I'm just going to keep this up there while I talk about advice because I really do think it's the, the most important thing if you're going to take one thing away from the hour here is that, you know, when you are in college, from what I remember, you know, a lot of what you're trying to do, you're reading about it, you think you're, you know, you want to be a writer, you think you want to be in PR or finance or whatever it is, um, but you don't really take the time to reach out to people who went to school here, sit down with them for a half hour, and just ask, what's this job like? What do I got to do to succeed in it? What do you like about your job? What do you not like about it? And it's, it's the best thing you can do. I mean, there is nothing that would replace talking to somebody who's been doing something for 15 or 20 years and they're candid with you and they give you genuine advice about what works and what doesn't work and just what their job is like day to day. And the good thing about it is, uh, you know, people like giving advice. Generally speaking, if you reach out to somebody who's got the kind of job that you aspire to be in in 10 or 15 years, in my experience, people love it. They love sitting down with somebody and getting into what are the things that, you know, they wish they did differently. And I love it. I only get like two or three emails a year from Wisconsin graduates of just, hey, can I chat? I'm interested in the entertainment world. I should be getting way more than that. Not because I know so much, but, you know, there's, there's only so many people out there. There's probably 400,000 alumni from uh, Wisconsin. I think it's thereabouts. Uh, you know, there's a group of them in there, and it doesn't have to be just alumni, by the way, but let's start there, who are doing exactly the thing that you want to do. You should be reaching out to them. And maybe some of you are, and this is all kind of obvious. But for me, I know when I was in school here, I just had a little bit more of it. I'm going to go it alone. Like when I decided I wanted to be a journalist, I didn't pick up the phone once and call the Philadelphia Inquirer and just sit down with a journalist for an hour. I just felt like, you know, articles and I just, I, I, I just did it on my own. I don't think that was the right way to go. There were other things, and I, and I put together a little list here of some areas where I felt like I did get it. Like the Obama girl thing, that was, when people say to me, like, what made the Obama girl thing work? Uh, you know, there's some tactical answers, but more than anything, it was that by this stage, I recognized how to build a team around me to give me the advice that made sense. So I had like a PR person in my ear telling me how I was going to get the press to cover it. And I had somebody else in my ear telling me about, you know, the right way to film it and somebody else who had YouTube experience. 
I just got much better at that point at being very open for asking for advice. And then we build it into this, you know, bigger comedy network. Um, and at YouTube, you know, the same thing. I find that when I got to the company three years ago, the thing that got me up to speed and that was most valuable was just setting up meetings with people who had been there for five or six years. So going through all these things that, you know, out, and then not all of them were just UW alumni, but for me, like the Badger Herald, where when I wrote a weekly column, I just, I remember very distinctly one conversation I had with a guy who was at the Badger Herald, he was a senior, I was a sophomore, took me out to coffee and completely changed my perspective on writing. And the first time I did a PR internship while here at Wisconsin, very similar thing where I you know, was fortunate to have somebody who actually had been in PR for 10 years to give me a sense of what a career really meant. And not going through all these, but my senior thesis and getting professor's advice and at Market Vision, my first company, and actually going to the resources here at Wisconsin to help me understand what it took to build a business plan. In business school, at ad agencies, a bomber girl, barely political. I just think that, you know, as a starting point, if you all go home and figure out ways to reach out and set up half hour Skype or, you know, Google Hangouts with people who you admire and respect and you'd love their opinion, that it could really be, again, you might be doing this, but for me, it would, have, it would have really been valuable. And I think for you guys, as you think about the kinds of things you want to do, carve out the time to talk to people who really have been in the field for a while and can give you advice and can give you their two cents on whether or not it's a fit and what you should do to succeed. Um, you know, I think part of the reason people avoid asking for advice is because they feel like it's imposing on people, or they feel like there's a certain amount that, you know, it's, I don't want to say weak of them to ask for advice, but they just don't feel like it's, uh, you know, as honorable to, to kind of go and, and set up meeting after meeting, basically just to say, let me pick your brain, can I get your two cents on things. I've found that as you're looking for jobs, I mean, you guys are freshmen mostly, it sounds like, so you don't have to, like, worry about full-time jobs yet at all, but when you do, you're better off taking the time to talk to people not under the context of, hey, this is exactly the position I want, I want this job. I would spend more time talking to people just about what they like about their job and what kind of advice they'd give you. Um, and that, that's why you should get it. And then how to get it, you know, for, from a resource perspective, you guys I'm sure know your way around the alumni website. Um, the other thing I would say is that you ultimately start to think and act and behave a bit like who the people are who surround you, who are your really true mentors, advisors, and to think about ways to reach out to people. And I know, by the way, also, when you get asked for advice, I would do the same back. But think about ways to kind of reach out to people and, and start to build a group where you feel like when you make decisions, you have a trusted group of people, different viewpoints, that can help you make the best decision for yourself. So that is, uh, of the three, they're all, I think all, all three of these things are important, but you know, listening to me for 45 minutes is not going to have nearly the impact as you setting up 25, 30 informational things, video chats, you know, spend a day in whatever city you want to work in, and really spending some time with people that have been doing the job. Okay, last thing I want to talk about, and then I think I want to talk, I'm going to get a little time check here, um, 20 minutes about YouTube strategy, Let's see where we're at, oh, we're good, um, is passion, but more... I would say that, you know, fr from a YouTube perspective, having been at the company for a while, both people within the company that do well and our creators that do really well, it just feels like they do everything with complete passion and commitment. And it, I don't really mean like, you know, you have to, your job has to be what you're most passionate about. I think I mean more like anything you do, commit yourself to it, be passionate about it. Passion in general is just very contagious. And whether it's, you know, first gig here, whatever, you know, working at the union or working at some local place or it's a project you're doing with teammates that when you throw yourself into something and people recognize your enthusiasm for something, of, of anything that I look for when I'm hiring people, that's probably the number one thing. And when I look at people that are successful, that tends to be the thing which I think is the most consistent, that they are passionate about what they do and that even when they do the things that aren't necessarily like exactly what they love most in the world, they figure out ways to get passionate about those two. So like from a YouTube creator perspective, you know, one that stands out is Lindsey Sterling. She's a, a rock violinist who never really would have probably been like the kind of success before YouTube. Um, but thanks to YouTube, she's built her whole audience around rock violin, which is such a you know, unique thing on YouTube or anywhere. But in meeting with her, it was almost like 
the, the YouTube had nothing to do with it. She was just on a mission, and every time I've seen her do any kind of song or any kind of performance or any kind of video, and I've worked there a lot this year, it's been, to me, just the complete enthusiasm and commitment to it that is, is what sets her apart. Um, so a couple other examples, I don't know if you guys see Freddie W, but same kind of thing, a filmmaker who just kind of blows me away, both with his talent, but also his ultimate passion and inspiration around film. Uh, that's Michael Stevens. Any you guys see Vsauce, by chance? All right, a couple hands. That's a, another channel that started back at my old company, Next New Networks. Um, and then myself, I, you know, I don't think that, um, I, I did stand-up comedy for a little while. I did the Obama girl thing. I would say that for me, the, the thing which has helped, you know, aside from the, the risks initially and the advice that I've gotten from people and the circle I've built, I think the other thing is really focused on, like, if I'm doing something and I'm putting my time and energy into it, what's the way I can really be as passionate and as excited and enthusiastic about it as possible? Because I think that kind of enthusiasm definitely carries over to other people. Um, so that is my 30 minutes takeaways from Wisconsin. I think a few risks that paid off helped me get a better uh, kind of understanding of how to take risks and how important it can be to take some from time to time. Uh, advice uh, is something where I feel there's an opportunity, especially right now while you're in school and it doesn't feel like you know, you're hitting people up for jobs, to go out there, reach out to people, and just set up some of these meetings with the kinds of people that you never think would respond to you or give you an hour, because a lot of them will. Not all of them, but a lot of them will. Um, and to whatever you do, be passionate about it and throw yourself into it. Uh, so RAP, I wanted, I wanted to end with a rap, you know, like some kind of hip, but I'm not gonna. I did start with something about risk, advice, and passion, and your career is gonna be smashing. But... <laughs> I should have done it. I should have done it. It would have been good. Okay, um, so that's a half hour on that. A couple, I, I had a couple other things that I threw in, actually, I have to admit, today, because they were saying, well, the, a lot of people here might be looking for very specific career advice. So a couple little bonus things here. One, uh, this is how people work now. Their desks are cluttered. If you're sending your emails to go get advice, or you're trying to do a project, whatever it is, uh, people right now definitely multitask. And generally speaking, I feel like, you know, when you send emails, you don't want to do this kind of thing. When you do PowerPoints, you don't want to do this kind of thing. And if, what is she doing there? <laughs> Holy cow. Um, you, uh, you, I, I would say from a skill set perspective, communication skills are, to me, the most important thing you can develop. And all, across the board, whether you're, you know, writing, speaking in front of groups, one-on-one -on -one interactions, the ability to communicate an idea in a concise, clear, compelling way is, doesn't matter the industry. It's just, a, it, it's just a thing that separates, I think, the people who get really far and some of the people that maybe don't. Because a lot of times, you can have the best idea in the world, but if you're not able to put it in front of people in a way, again, whether it's email, PowerPoint, speaking to a group in a way that they'll recall it, then it, it, sometimes the idea just it won't have as much impact. So number one skill I'm going to say, whether it's speaking classes or figuring out a way to be in a position where you can speak to some groups or taking a writing course, communication to me doesn't matter pretty much the industry. Uh, really important one. Um, I think I, I, I'm going to keep moving because I'm a little behind time, so you're just going to have to guess what that was. It was important advice. Uh, that's an Emerson thing. I'm going I'm to catch up here, though. Um, risk, advice, and passion to me are the three, uh, the three things which I remember most about the last, uh, you know, 20 years or so as being things that I always kind of come back to as reasons for some of the things that I've done that have worked. Um, that is, let's see, is that? Right. So that is uh, 30 minutes on where I feel like you will uh, have an opportunity being here at Wisconsin. I'm super jealous and you have, you know, all kinds of things you can do and doors that you can open that, you know, are harder to do later, and so I take advantage of those. I have another 20 minutes on like YouTube stuff, um, you know, how to, basically what my job is, like how you can succeed on YouTube, but maybe so we're not too all over the place, we can do five minutes, what do we got there? A web questions, perfect.